Dear viewers from all over the map, welcome to my channel. The Curios features book reviews, tech tips, earning money online, and more. In this video, I will walk you through Karen Armstrong's famous book, A History of God, The 4,000-Year Quest of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Coming up next on The Curious. <laughs> Why does God exist? How have the three governing monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, shaped and altered the conception of God? How have these religions influenced each other? In this stunningly intelligent book, Karen Armstrong, one of Britain's foremost commentators on religious affairs, traces the history of how men and women have perceived and experienced God. From the time of Abraham to the present, the epic story begins with the Jews' gradual transformation of pagan idol worship in Babylon into true monotheism, a concept previously unknown in the world. Christianity and Islam both rose on the foundation of this revolutionary idea, but these religions refashioned the one God to suit the social and political needs of their followers. From classical philosophy and medieval mysticism to the Reformation, Karen Armstrong performs the near miracle of distilling the intellectual history of monotheism into one superbly readable volume, destined to take its place as a classic. One day in the Middle East about 4,000 years ago, an elderly but still rather astonishingly spry gentleman took his son for a walk up a hill. The young man carried on his back some wood that his father had told him they would use at the top to make an altar, upon which they would then perform the ritual sacrifice of a burnt offering, unbeknownst to the son. However, the father had another sort of sacrifice in mind altogether. Abraham, the father, had been commanded by the God he worshipped as supreme above all others to sacrifice the young man himself, his beloved and only legitimate son, Isaac. We all know how things turned out. Of course, an angel appeared, together with a ram, letting Abraham know that God didn't really want him to kill his son, that he should sacrifice the ram instead, and that the whole thing had merely been a test. And to modern observers, at least, it's abundantly clear what exactly was being tested. Should we pose the question to most people familiar with one of the three Abrahamic religious traditions Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all of which trace their origins to this misty figure, and which together claim half the world's population? The answer would come without hesitation. God was testing Abraham's faith. If we could ask someone from a much earlier time, however, a time closer to that of Abraham himself, the answer might be different. The usual story we tell ourselves about faith and reason says that faith was invented by the ancient Jews, whose monotheistic tradition goes back to Abraham, in the fullness of time, or, depending on perspective, in a misguided departure. The newer faiths of Christianity and Islam split off from their Jewish roots and grew to become world religions in their own right. Meanwhile, in a completely unrelated series of events, the rationalistic paragons we know as the ancient Greeks invented reason and science. The Greek tradition of pure reason has always clashed with the monotheistic tradition of pure faith. Though numerous thinkers have tried to reconcile them through the ages, it's a tidy tale of two pristinely distinct entities that do fine, perhaps, when kept apart, but which hiss and bubble like fire and water when brought together. A tidy tale, to be sure, but nearly all wrong. Historians have been struggling to correct it for more than a century. What they haven't done, however, is work out the implications of their findings in a way that gives us a new narrative explanation to take its place. This failure of synthesis may have something to do with why the old, discredited story has hung on for so long in popular imagination. Because we separate faith and reason psychologically, thinking of them as epistemological opposites, we tend rather uncritically to assume that they must have separate historical origins as well. A moment's reflection says it ain't necessarily so, and is even unlikely to be so. It's time for a new narrative about the origins of monotheistic faith, one that's indebted to recent scholarship, but that puts it together in a coherent pattern consistent with both history and psychology. Surprisingly, the pattern that fits best with the historical evidence locates the origins of faith and the rise of reason itself. And despite its novelty it does so in a way that I suspect will strike many readers as sensible and intuitive. This new synthesis in turn yields psychological insights into the issues of faith and reason that continue to bedevil us today. From public confrontations over evolution, abortion, and gay rights, to suicide bombings, West Bank settlements, and flying lessons in which students ominously disdain instruction and landing. Of course, faith is notoriously hard to define. But belief in God presents a common-sense starting point. 
It's true that we sometimes use the word faith to describe non-monotheistic religious traditions such as Buddhism or Hinduism, but even if we acknowledge the marginal presence of something we call faith in such traditions, it seems clear that monotheistic religions emphasize faith in ways that other religions do not. Any religious practice implies a basic belief in one's own objects of worship. That sort of belief, common to all humanity, is the part of our larger religious instinct that we might call the mental faculty of faith. It permits worshipers to accept the existence and divinity of gods whom they themselves do not worship, as people did. For example, in ancient Greece and Rome, monotheism, by contrast, at least the kind we're familiar with, requires disbelief in the existence or divinity of other objects of worship. In saying my God is the only God, monotheists also say, your God isn't God unless it's the same as my God. Faith, in this sense, encompasses more than mere religious belief. It also entails a negative belief about other kinds of belief, a peculiar kind of exclusivity found only in true monotheism. We might call that exclusive sort of belief the tradition of faith, admittedly, all kinds of religion rely on tradition, but let's try a thought experiment. Imagine for a moment that we could wave a magic wand and make everyone on the planet forget everything they know about religion. At the same time, we can erase every word of religious scripture, along with all religious representations in art and literature. The idea is to imagine a state of total religious amnesia, so that we'd all be starting from scratch. If we wiped all religion away, anthropology suggests, it would rapidly reappear in new yet familiar forms, but probably without monotheism. Assuming that history is any guide, religion in the broad sense clearly represents a human instinct, since we find it in all human societies. But we can safely say that there's no instinct for monotheism as such, since no society ever came up with the idea independently after it first appeared. There were no monotheists until the idea of one god was invented and all monotheists ever since have worshipped their one god only because they got the idea from those who came before them. Which may have something to do with why monotheists speak of being converted, or turn together toward the worship of a single, unitary god. If you worship that sort of god, you share in that single, though by now hardly unitary, tradition. Some will object that their faith is entirely a matter of their own internal attitude, but my point is that this internal attitude wouldn't exist, and never has existed without a tradition to guide the shaping of it. The monotheistic tradition of faith seems to focus and amplify the mental faculty of faith, concentrating the idea of the divine into a single, exclusive deity. That the world's monotheisms descended from a single ancestor probably also helps perpetuate the common perception that it all started with Abraham, who else but the Jews, those famous monotheists from way back. Yet religious scholars agree that this isn't quite the sort of belief that Abraham would have recognized. Modern research suggests that the religion of Abraham and his fellow Hebrews was not, strictly speaking, monotheistic at all, but monolatrous. In other words, during Abraham's time and for many centuries afterward, the ancient Hebrews worshipped not a god whom they held to be the sole deity in existence, but simply one god among many a god whom they conceived of as being more powerful than the jostling plethora of lesser gods worshipped by other peoples, but who nonetheless shared the stage with them. This essentially polytheistic outlook accords with the frequent mention of other gods in the Hebrew Bible. For example, it also accords with the way that Abraham's faith has the feel of a contractual arrangement. When religious scholars use the word faith at all to describe Abraham's attitude to his god, it's generally coupled with a word like juridical, only some seven centuries later. It's thought, did this God reveal to Moses that his real name was Yahweh, and that he wished to be known and worshipped under that name henceforth, worshipped, still, it seems, as one among many. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, says the first commandment, implying that other gods were indeed a possibility. If an odious one, some of them may have been behind the staffs into serpents trick by which Pharaoh's wise men tried to outconjure Moses' brother Aaron, before their serpents were eaten up by Yahweh's, nor, like El before him, does Yahweh appear at first to have been thought of by the Hebrews as a divine creator? At least not according to the picture we get from the last century or so of biblical scholarship. Scholars believe that not until the 8th century BC was the first biblical account of creation composed, and that only a couple of centuries later did an anonymous priestly author write down the full-blown version we get starting at Genesis 1. The Greek word apocalypsis is usually translated as revelation. The original meaning of both words is unveiling, or a bringing forth of the hidden. For true believers, 
This became the time when the end scene will literally come out of hiding to annihilate the scene in a final act of glorious revenge for being so brusquely pushed to the side. From an epistemological standpoint, all believers are marginalized in this world. In pinning its hopes on the next world, what faith reveals is the ancestral mark of religion's marginalization at the hands of reason. It's no coincidence that apocalypticism has always been central to Islam as well as to Christianity, or that its darkest phantasms currently preoccupy many of the most enraged Islamists nine for religious extremists of all stripes. Secularism and those who wish to accommodate it are always the biggest enemies. That goes for the Jewish settlers who believe their presence in the West Bank is part of God's plan and a prelude to apocalyptic war as well as for their ostensibly unlikely political allies. The millions of American Christians who await the rapture. It's been observed that the title of the best-selling Left Behind series tells us precisely what the rapture is all about. Feeling left behind. The end times retain their original intoxicating flavor of revenge fantasy, which evolved first in a specific social context, but rapidly acquired broader appeal as cosmic payback for the outrage of naturalistic thinking. Thanks for watching. The Amazon link for this unputdownable book is as usual in the description box. Give this video a thumbs up if you want to see more videos from this channel. If you know of a useful book that could benefit others, let me know in the comments below. And if you're new here click on the subscribe button and notification icon for more useful books and other related stuff from the curious.